floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, um, and thank you to our host for hosting us today. Thank you to my distinguished speakers for joining me, and thank you for everyone to, for participating in this panel. Uh, our discussion today is, uh, is, in, is on intergenerational dialogue and action on ethics and AI. I am Nolita Mavonello. I am a program manager at the Club of Rome and a director of the 50%, a global platform of systems innovators from all across the world. So this conversation of intergenerational leadership and AI is a very important one to me and my peers, and I'm very excited for the discussion we're going to have today. There's a QR code um, on the screen, as per usual. Please feel free to ask questions um, to our speakers um, so you know we can have a more engaged and involved conversation. The Club of Rome has partnered with Globe Ethics to deliberate the question of whether digitalization will support or threaten our ability to bring equitable well-being on a healthy planet. Over the past year, we've brought together AI ex experts and AI ethics experts to consider whether there is a need for a Geneva Compact. It was made during Geneva Peace Week. That's why it's called the Geneva Compact. And um, towards addressing the ethical complexities of artificial intelligence. One critical complexity of AI ethics is represented through the integration of the desires, perspectives, and power spectrum that exists in the generations today and the generations to come. This plenary seeks to further the dialogue initiated by the compact, focusing specifically on intergenerational dialogue and action. Our objective is to explore how different generations perceive the ethical challenges posed by AI, the expectations they hold, and how these can be integrated into the ongoing development and refinement of the ambitious compact on AI ethics. With me today is Noor Akada, Product Manager at Learning Planet Institute. In the far end, we have R Rain Esomaj, co-founder of Digital Coalition and CEO at Evolving Consulting. Next to Noor, we have Marina Dang, Executive Director at Higher Education for Good Foundation. And last but not least, we have Alex Maza, Sustainability Lead and Board Member at Cardano Foundation. I got it, thank you. But to start off with our discussion today, I'd like for our panelists to just share their initial perspectives on the topic um, and share the initiatives that you're working on to address this issue. Starting with you, Noah. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Club of Rome, Globe Ethics, for organizing this and for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this conversation with all of you. So um, I have to start with one of my personal experiences in the beginning of my career. So I started as an engineer specialized in natural language processing back when it was a little bit more obscure than it is now. And I was working on the transition from translation done by humans on technical fields that are very repetitive and have a like, very fixed structure to machine translation on these fields. So I was part of the team of engineers that were building these neural machine translation models and then also um, uh, deploying the models. And then I was also part of the team that was training translators to use it. And what we realized very quickly is that translators did not like us very much. And um, one of the things that they were saying is, you are replacing my job, you are taking away the spirit of what I like to do in my job. And if, if I lacked empathy, which I don't, <laughs> then it's very easy to say like, oh, but no, I understand this model. I know that all it's doing is kind of helping you clear the table of repetitive, not so intellectually stimulating tasks, so you can make space for maybe more intellectually stimulating tasks. But that's because I know how the model works. So what we did is we organized these training sessions that were very much general AI culture sessions on how these model works, what kind of data do we train them on, and what you need to do with the model output. Because you don't just use the output as is, you do have to um, post edit the machine translation output. And we realized that after those, traini those trainings that we did, the conversion rate for translators that were, um, that were open to accepting machine translation jobs just was so much higher. 
And that's when I realized that, you know, I always believed this, but this kind of confirmed it for me, is that education really is at the heart of, of this. And that's what brings us to AI literacy. And I truly believe that if you have people in all um, levels and in all steps of uh, model creation and deployment that are educated on the ethical concerns, but also, um, but also on how the model works, it's not just about data scientists learning about ethics and ethicists learning about data science. It really is about creating an ethical ecosystem around AI creation and deployment. And that goes through literacy at all levels in all generations. And when we think about literacy, we're talking about that human or those humans in the context where a model is deployed that are there to interpret the model output. So we really are giving back to these people through education, their agency to make decisions based on a model output. It's not just the model's output, it, what, it's what is the outcome in that context. And um, when I'm speaking about outcomes versus outputs, now there has been a movement since I think 2019 with fairness metrics that have been um, released that are supposed to tell you how fair your model is in production. And even though a model can seem fair with a number, we do realize that that's not the same in production. And it really is just giving back that human agency. Now, with all of this, I think, you know, human agency, education, and fairness metrics, these to me right now kind of seem like responsive measures and um, not, not, um, not forward-looking preventative measures. And that's why I really believe there's not really a solutions crisis. We have a lot of solutions in healthcare and education and other fields. It's more of a, I see more of a values crisis. What are the values that are guiding the creation of these models? Are we, do we want to develop models that will help you know, protect and regenerate coral reefs and other natural ecosystems? Or do we wanna build models that are gonna have even stronger targeted marketing algorithms and like social media algorithms that are gonna contribute to like more social alienation. And that's really what we need to focus on. Do we have a set of shared values to guide the development of AI today? Do the people who control the creation of models and their deployments share these values? And do young people also buy into these values? And are we creating a future that we envision for them? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Nolita, uh, Club of Rome and Globetics for making this happen. Um, so my name is Marine. I'm also an engineer, in fact, um, but um, my background is very multidisciplinary. Uh, after my engineering studies, um, I um, did a, a master in uh, political science and then a PhD in innovation management. Um, so after that, uh, to make this story short, because we don't have a lot of time, and I don't want to talk about me, but I want to talk about this project. Today, I lead this amazing project called Youth Talks. So please remember that and um, put a note, open your smartphone, whatever, but look for Youth Talks. Um, this is uh, the largest youth consultation ever today. Um, we started from scratch two years ago, so it was literally it was a dream. And today, um, along our consultations, we managed to get the opinions of more than 40, in fact now, 55,000 young people coming from 212 countries and territories. What makes us very specific and very innovative is the fact that we ask these young people open-ended questions. We invite them to freely discuss different hot topics. This is very important because when you ask these young people closed-ended questions, and especially questions that we, the, the maybe uh, more, I don't want to say old people, maybe more experienced people, when we design the questions, we prevent them from thinking out of the box, right? Because we have a mindset, we have a specific mindset and we design the questions with this mindset. So it prevents these young people to think out of, of the box and, and really uh, bring new uh, ideas, new things on the table. So anyway, the reason why we're able to do so is because of these algorithms. And I mean, this is your area of expertise, natural language processing, um, algorithms, uh, sometimes people like to call it AI, but 
yeah, I, I don't want to go that way. So anyway, thanks to the, these algorithms and all these technologies, we are able to collect all these answers to these open-ended questions, all the online discussions between young people and to analyze what they said, what they discussed and what really matters for them, right? So at Youth Talks, this is what we did. As I said before, we launched a project two years ago with a large consultation on their aspirations, needs, fears, um, we even asked them um, what were their priorities in terms of education, what do they need to learn to achieve what they need to achieve uh, for the future of the world that they want, for the future of our society. Um, and we also um, more recently launched another consultation called Youth Talks on Artificial Intelligence. Um, I'm eager to share uh, some of the results with you and I will do so during that panel. But maybe just to answer the questions that the question that you didn't ask, in fact, but why do we need to have these intergenerational dialogues, right? So I will share with you maybe only three ideas. The first one being, um, do you know that 50% of humans on this planet uh, are less than 30 years old? So why shouldn't we um, involve them? Uh, when we think about AI and regulations and ethics of AI. Seems weird, right? Um, here I quote, the average hiring age of CEOs at Fortune 500 and S&P 500 companies has risen significantly over the past decade from 51 to 55 years old, while the average age of board members stands at 63 years old, right? So there is definitely an issue here, especially in this VUCA world where complexity uh, is definitely a word that we use every day. The second idea would be, uh, of course, young people will be the one living uh, with the consequences of the decision that we make today. So that's a second argument that is important. Um, and last but not least, uh, not all the time, of course, and we need experienced people, not to say old ones. Um, I'm 30 something, so I'm kind of out of the bracket range. I mean, depend, <laughs> it depends what you consider being the young people, like, um, so anyway, but we, we definitely need experienced people. But these days, because of the complexity of the world and especially because of the technology that we have to live with day after day, uh, we need these young people because sometimes, like more often, uh, now they really understand the complexity of that world. They understand these technologies. They, they, I mean, for, for most of them, they were practically born uh, with these technologies. They grew up with these technologies. So we need to also have their inputs. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Mauser, and I'd like to thank you all for lending your ears and your brains to this uh, panel discussion just before lunch. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers, actually, because the question around intergenerational aspects of things had me thinking about my childhood. I very much remember when I was taught how to go through a dictionary in an efficient manner. I remember the first time I used Google. And back then you had to be really, really precise about the keywords that you would put in, right? And it was painful if you didn't. 10, 20 years later, um, Google got really, really good. And sort of last year, the year before, we all kind of found ourselves prompting GPTs with very similar keywords. And so it got me thinking about access to information in my generation, that of my parents, and really, you know, what would happen in future. Of course, knowledge is power and where knowledge is contained and where it's accessible, that determines a lot of things. Um, I grew up in South Africa. I have worked at uh, the intersection of research uh, and innovation cooperation for Switzerland. And that's where I got into digital technologies like AI, and more particularly and more recently, blockchain technology, which I've been working on for the past four years. Now, you might ask yourself, what the heck is a blockchain guy doing at an AI conference? And ethics. 
Um, <laughs> the key thing here is, and this is something I want to bring about in this panel, is that there's actually a convergence between these two uh, transformative digital technologies. Specifically, you can look at some lessons learned from the blockchain world that could be applied into the AI space, as well as some of the applications of blockchain technology to fairer and more ethical, transparent AI. The first of which relates about the environment and how environmentally intensive these technologies can, should, or could be, and then how these are governed. We heard a lot about people's, uh, well, these language models uh, biases, who holds the keys to power in terms of creating them. And these are some of the things that I'd like to touch on today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ren, and uh, I can... Uh, the other member of the panel, I'm an engineer, but uh, I don't really like to talk about the technical things uh, when it comes to technology, which is my background. Um, I rather talk about technology by usage, basically because I think that technology is a mean to improve and have a positive impact in our daily lives. Um, last year, I was to um, attend a conference on um, a creative, I mean, on leading innovation in, in the area of AI, um, a conference by um, Francis Ford Coppola. And he was actually explaining how um, he brings innovation into um his job as a filmmaker and that was quite interesting and and from that you can see that text actually ends up in every sector of life and something that was interesting uh about this conference was that most of his uh, i mean the conclusion the main conclusion from francis ford coppola was to to um actually envision the fact that in the future we might not have kids uh, we might have cyborgs as kids and I was actually quite threatened by that. Uh, I should be a tech evangelist, like uh, Sita mentioned, but I'm not, actually. I think about tech by usage. Uh, and what I see from my experience as a consultant is the fact that um, bringing technology in our society has changed mainly one thing, is the way we communicate. And build on what has been said in the previous panel about engaging every strait and every demographics into the conversation is very crucial for us to design uh, um, proper solutions. So um, intergenerational dialogue is really at the foundation of that because we can see that if you look at the different demographics in terms of age, gender, diversity, or maybe the cultural background, what is important for people is actually that they don't understand, they don't communicate in the same way. And where ethics and AI can actually, or tech in a general uh, way can actually help us is actually to bring a convergence on how we communicate um, all together. Being, no more, more, being not self-centered, but, but mainly other-centered. So if you are a senior, if you are an adult, or if you are youth, then we communicate in various and different way. And tech is not going to help us to communicate in the same way. That would never happen. Humanity is about diversity. But AI or tech generally can actually help us to communicate or to understand or to better understand each other so that we have solutions that speaks to everyone and that are inclusive. So I will keep it here and then maybe expand later. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you for introducing your perspectives and your work on this topic and it's multifaceted. Um, and I guess it's because the, the challenge itself is complex because having a conversation about generations is hard. It's like saying, let's have a conversation about half of all humans and how we should involve them in dialogue and action. Um, however, challenging as all encompassing or an opportunity as all encompassing as emerging technologies requires, as you'd say, Marine, that complex level of engagement and depth. 
And maybe there's also an opportunity to look into what have we learned before and what do we need to learn? So Alex, I'll bring this one to you because you had mentioned earlier about there are some transferable learnings between um, blockchain and artificial intelligence when it comes to how we consider the impacts and the ethics. Um, what is the general awareness that there is of these dynamics, but also uh, to add a more intergenerational spice into it, um, when it comes to adoption and how it impacts our perceptions of how you, adoption of blockchain happened and how we're seeing the adoption of AI, what can we learn there also? Complex question. Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to tackle it. Um, who here feels comfortable about their knowledge on AI? I'm just gonna like raise your hand. Okay. Now, same question, but with blockchain. Somewhat, okay, cool. Um, for AI, there are experts in this room. With blockchain, a very simplified explanation of what it is, is a digital distributed ledger that allows people to transact value and govern value in a disintermediated fashion. So the T-Ledger, debit and credit, it's pretty much as if it exists in all of your pockets and you can check what has happened or not. This is important in terms of understanding the transparency of decision-making, of transactions. And when applied to, for example, training a large language model, you can very much understand and create a trace of authenticity, of traceability of how this model was created, what decisions were made, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a step back from the technology into something more concrete, the environment. Who here has heard Bitcoin consumes as much energy as a small nation state? Nice media buzzword. The real stat is Bitcoin consumes as much as one uh, television sets globally per year, right? So it's a little bit less of a fantastic headline. So imagine all the TVs were on for a year. That's Bitcoin or digital gold for some people. Bitcoin isn't the only blockchain, right? There, there's a plethora of these, and actually most of these are highly energy efficient. Yet, because of this buzzword, the blockchain industry has gotten a bad rep amongst policymakers, amongst regulators, and we've been pushed to really optimize a very young industry towards environmental compliance. Um, this is in the US, uh, as well as in the EU, uh, with uh, some more recent regulations that have been involved in getting the environmental statistics of the particular blockchain that I work for. And now there are industry standards for this, to the point where you know how much carbon, we can estimate with a lot of certainty, how much carbon and how much energy was consumed in one transaction and relate that to a unit of value. In the AI world, we have some understanding of how much it costs to run a data center, how much it might cost to train GPT-3, not GPT-4, 4.0. And to use it is a really fascinating thing. One query into a GPT-3 is the equivalent of turning on a light bulb for an hour. Now think about how many times you've used ChatGPT in the past month. That's one room in your house that's lit. And so I think one of the key um, aspects that AI can learn from blockchain is to actually optimize towards transparency around energy efficiency um, and measurement as early on as possible so that that aspect does not stifle that industry's growth from a regulatory perspective. And then, of course, people will need to optimize their um, technical systems with that, with governance. And this is where it gets a little bit more intergenerational. I can speak on the Cardano blockchain, where actually we have a system of value that's currently worth about $12 billion of market prices and has its own treasury of approximately $600 million. This belongs to every single holder of a Cardano token. They can decide where that money is spent, what kind of design decisions are made from a technical perspective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we want this technology, this Cardano blockchain to be used ethically, the decision-making within these processes needs to follow these sorts of lines. And so there's a lot of this that's happening in the blockchain industry. And essentially what it allows is permissionlessness of participation. That's real access. It's if you think there's a problem and you think you know how to solve it, you can pick up a spade. 
and they'll be ground to shovel. Whereas when it comes to AI governance, what we see are typically um, large um, big tech companies, as well as, let's say, obscurely incorporated organizations that are creating these large language models. And yes, they do open source them, but only after they've been developed. And so do you have access to that decision-making? Unless you're a shareholder of one of these companies, or unless you're one of the board members or executives, or somebody that really has a decision-making power within the business units, you don't really have that. So these are some of the ways from an environmental perspective, as well as from a governance perspective that AI and blockchain can meet. And I just want to add one last thing to the governance bit. For Cardano to be governed, we've created a constitution. Now we see a blockchain as not only a technological construct, but a social one. So in that constitution, we have things relating to values, as well as some very technical guardrails. And to do this, to build this constitution up, there have been, or there will be, close to 70 workshops held globally across different regions, different countries, to really gather the insights of people that have different lived experiences to each other. And it's not just about the global north and the global south. It's within certain countries and certain locations uh, there. So yeah, I'll pause on that. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. You bring up quite a few um, important points, but I will use your point on governance to then ask Rain her question, because um, we are living in an ever increasingly fragmented society. Um, and in my work, I see the topic of intergenerational dialogue and action coming up even more because they these tensions of fragmentation are showing differently depending on the generation or the, their, you know, a, attitudes or approach to technology. So how do we address this from the perspective of creating an inclusive and sustainable society? Okay, thank you, Nalita. So um, basically what I mentioned earlier is um, the conversation and the communication. And if you think about technology, when I started my engineering courses, that was like 24 years ago, we're talking about machine learning, natural language speaking, and all those things. And everything is around communication. So basically uh, what the tech people have uh, actually invited is uh, invented is the change management process. Like we are going to design a technology and we are going to teach you how to uh, adapt that technology. So now I want you to think in a reverse way. Instead of designing technology, maybe we should start by onboarding people that are supposed to use those technologies. And when I talk about conversation, the way you communicate at the age of 20, is not the same way uh, at the age of 40, nor 60. So the young people of today are going to communicate in a different way. And what we are doing with AI is just pushing words and getting answers. So we are starting building system with biases that does not represent the diversity of the society. So what I do think is that we should start by uh, having not the change management process, but on board all the customer representative or the diversity so that we start building systems that are not designed to provide application or solution, but are designed to understand the evolution of the society, given to its local context, even if it has global uh, um, uh, foundation. So this is the way to do things. And if I want to give maybe a practical example based on what uh, Alex uh, previously said, he mentioned AI, he mentioned uh, blockchain. So in blockchain, there is something that we use uh, that is called smart contracts. I bet that most of you use it to do your digital payment using your phone or whatever. Uh, you don't know what is the tech behind, but you use it. So uh, when you have to design maybe digital payment, uh, the way young people are going to use digital payment is not the same way uh, that uh, um, maybe um, senior or adults are going to use digital payments. So, you know, uh, given people's 
sensitivity to security, privacy, they're going to use it in a different way. So if you have all those customer representatives, then you are able to build a solution that respects the tech principle, but also fits the need and the way people want to communicate and to get the information. Some of them would like to get uh, their uh, receipt, their ticket into the physical mode, into uh, by email, not printing at all, just showing, uh, et cetera. So all that, we do it. Tech people, they do, they do it actually. Uh, they just look at um, the needs and especially when it comes to money and rentability of application, they naturally do it. So what we need to do is to integrate all those principles into the design of solutions and maybe um, the tech foundational blocks or AI foundational blocks so that we manage to have system that will not dictate the way we should communicate, but will understand that maybe the way people communicate in the 20s, uh, I mean, in this century, it's not, the, it's not going to be the same way in the upcoming century. Obviously, we won't be here to see that, but we need to prepare the future. And I do think that um, when it comes to tech, or oh, it's basically about understanding what people, um, uh, what are the, the human expectation actually. And when you understand those human expectation, when you have a sort of ethics and conscience and, and, and sort of conscience about what is good for the society nowadays and in the future, and those ethics uh, principles, they don't change, they are the same. So we can apply them and build um, technological systems that evolve with our society. And um, that uh, journey is not impossible. I, I really like uh, this Anthony Robbins quote, like the only impossible journey is the one you will never start. I think we are able to do that. And uh, it just requires a small wheel to put uh, that theory into action and start doing the right things. Thank you. Human expectation and communication, you mentioned that as central to what you, you know, what you were sharing. I mean, also you're speaking about like technology for its use. So it makes me want to then go over to you, Maureen. Because um, when I think about communication and its evolution, I also think about social media and how that also, you know, changed how we communicate with one another, et cetera. And different voices are then able to be heard in a fragmented society. However, being heard does not mean that everyone is recognized as a stakeholder or their percep perceptions and their desires are integrated into the creation of a technology, et cetera, et cetera. So how can young people play a role in ensuring AI ethics? Um, and how do, can they keep it as a central focus in those discussions um, and be recognized as real stakeholders when it comes to deploying, implementing, creating, governing different technologies? This is a very hard one. Mm. Thank you very much, Nolita. Um, okay, so of course, there are many ways to involve young people when it comes to that kind of, of topic and very important topic. So I will not discuss all of them. The UN General Secretary said not so long ago that with young people, we have different ways of interacting. Either we ignore them, which we used to do a couple of years ago, we can listen to them, the, the dialogue, sorry, with them, or co-construct with them. And I guess this is what we want, right? Co-construct with 50% of this population who is under 30 years old. Um, so one way is to do what we try to do with youth talks, which is to lead, launch, run uh, mass uh, consultation to allow these young people all over the world to express themselves, to have a voice. Again, we were not able to do so a couple of years ago because we didn't have the technology to analyze and do something about what they had to say. We could collect their voices, but then nothing. Just to give you an idea, with Youth Talks, during the first consultation, these 50,000 uh, young people, they shared with us more than 1 million ideas. <laughs> what do you do with one million ideas if you don't have the technology to analyze it, right? So we analyzed these uh, one million ideas. Um, let me just maybe take a step back just to, to let you to share with you a couple of things. 
um, one of the most striking results of this first consultation was their answer to what do you need to learn to build the future that you want? What is the priority for you to learn? And you know, we targeted young people between 15 and 29, but most of them were between 19 and 24. So the Gen Z, right? And their top priority all over the world, except in China, which is very interesting. Uh, we can discuss that further later. Um, but like all over the world, the top priority was can we, they, they, said, they said to us, can we please relearn how to live together? Can we please relearn like fundamental, like core values, virtues, principles? It's kind of weird. I mean, we were expecting like, I don't know, mathematics, technologies, AI, blockchain, why not? But not all of them, all of them ask like, can we please relearn how to live together? And it's not only about soft skills, right? Which is kind of a buzzword. They talked about developing empathy, open-mindedness, solidarity, etc. So it was kind of striking. And unfortunately, I don't have time to expand on this, but this is what led us to launch after that, the consultation on artificial intelligence, because they didn't, they didn't spontane spontaneously, they didn't talk about technologies and artificial intelligence. Um, I think less than 5% of them mentioned these topics uh, to answer these questions. So we were super surprised about this. And, but I guess um, they are clear sighted. I guess they have, in fact, a really clear vision of the future. And it's all related to what we mentioned during the previous panel, like make sure that the human is at the center of technology. This is like very important for them. For us, it's like a concept. Even in the previous panel, um, some of the panelists said, we, we did not manage to really understand what it means to put the human at the, at the center of the technology. But you have to understand that for these young people, it's not a concept that we need to define. For them, this is like the priority number one, because when you were younger, you used to go in the streets and you used to talk to your friends and, and you used to, to learn how to live with other humans, how to interact with other humans. This is not necessarily the case for them. You have to imagine, you have to remember that today, the families are kind of, I mean, people travel a lot, um, divorce, um, the mother is here, the father is there, there is no communities anymore. Then on the top of this, you will have social media, right? And the pandemic. So you have to imagine that these young people, like for them, before using this technology, what they really want is relearn how to live together. And then maybe, maybe we can do something good with that technology. So it's not about, um, uh, it's not about creating the best young people in the world. It's about creating the best young people for the world, which is very different, right? 